London, all the way. Hi from LA. <laughs> Sunny California. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, for the first in the series of um, the craft of composition, um, which is hosted by the Ivers Academy, um, and lots of people uh, on this will probably be members, so know what the Ivers Academy is already. Um, but for those of you who don't, um, it's an association for music creators of all sorts, songwriters, composers. Um, and probably most famously, they organise two amazing awards ceremonies every year. The Ivan Novello um, Awards, which were the nominations for this year, were just announced earlier this week. And um, the Ivan Composers Award, which are later in the year. And of course, Paul, you were a nominee previously for the Ivan oh, Novello no, Award. No, no. I was checking it all out <laughs> yesterday, though, and I was, it made me realise like, the number of composers that I know and also don't know and genuinely like the amount of talent out there because you're suddenly just seeing all that going oh my god I love that one oh my god I love that one oh I know her oh I know him it's like yeah it's a good community <laughs> it's a really good community so so this is great it's just so wonderful to have you here um just one piece of uh practical um please put questions on the uh Q&A not the chat and um, we'll get to those at the end. But me. first of all... One bit, one bit of technical advice. <laughs> 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 um, but first of all, congratulations for on Tales from the Loop. Um, it has been one of the highlights of my lockdown viewing. Um, You've had a, a very really, bad lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Really, it's really, it was, um, it's just a, a, I found it a very moving kind of uh, piece of art. The whole series and um, not least because of the amazing school that you wrote together with Philip Glass um, and I really want us to kind of go quite deep into that because I think there's a lot to be said about the series and the process um, but thinking about how diverse your career has been and um, how it's uh, TV, film, video games, um, working with bands, all sorts of recording elements to it. I thought that maybe we could start by kind of going back to the beginning and, and hearing like how... Your life music suddenly <laughs> coming <laughs> exactly. on. <laughs> Let's get that big red book out. And, um, and yeah, I, I'd love to hear that, that sort of the path. Honestly, ask, ask away, ask anything. If it's if it's <laughs> off, I'll say no. But other than that, just ask away. So, did you start out classically trained? Is that that's your sort of starting point? Yeah, I mean, I studied at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music Conservatoire. Um, but before that, Mum's a music teacher, so she's a brilliant flautist, um, or flutist as they call it over here. Um, and yeah, God, I remember playing. The frog song with Paul McCartney at Christmas, and the poor relations having to sit there with my brother on cello, me on piano, and my sister probably on recorder or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, so cl classically trained, and then didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just knew that I loved writing music and having anything to do with music. And so I applied for the Guildhall and applied for the Royal Scottish Academy of Music because mum's from Scotland, lots of Scottish family up there in Glasgow. And they were like, well, you should come and check it out. There's a lovely new theatre here. And went up there and said, oh, this is a really good vibe. And I think I just planned to be in Glasgow for three years. Um, and just loved it so much. I spent the next, whatever, 20, 23, 24, however many years kind of there. It was, it was just brilliant. I loved it. And more than that, it was the creative scene there I just loved. So although I started learning inverted commas film music, whatever the hell that is, the teacher buggered off after a term. <laughs> I was like, okay, he's gone to Hollywood, what am I gonna do? So I kind of you know, learned orchestration, um, did, just basically made the most of my time there. And then got to know a load of bands from Stowe College and there was a studio called Savat in Glasgow. I've told this story many times, but yeah, basically there was a studio there. I rented out a little room at the back. Craig Armstrong was there, I was there. And then in the main studios, there are all these bands like Texas and Simple Minds and Ben Sebastian and Mogwai and Snow Patrol and all of that. And I don't know, they just saw me as the classical dude. So I just started writing strings for all of their albums. And then they just, oh, this is quite cool. There's a, there's, a, there's a dude that works with bands. Let's get him to do a film, you know? And then, I don't know, it just kind of happened organically, I guess. Which I think is the best way. And I think, in, interestingly, so increasingly it's, 
I think that the film world is also open to that, isn't it? It's like, you, you know, you actually do have that very secure training in, in, in classical. And or, or lack of. Position. Yeah, hang, but hanging also, around studios and going to pubs does not constitute training. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that, that um, directors and producers, are sort of, you know, a, a lot of um, the movement towards uh, people who are maybe not so traditionally um, trained as film composers, but maybe because directors were listening to those bands and loved those sounds that they, you know, they start yeah, being was, open to that. When I was starting out, and literally one of the first short films I did was with a wonderful director called David McKenzie, who was nominated for an Oscar two years ago, I think. But he's, he's from Glasgow and we did chatting away and was doing this. And he phoned me up late one evening and said, well, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm just remixing this band with Richard from Bell and Sebastian. I was like, well, who's the band? I was like, Snow Patrol. He said, that's my favourite band. One person in the world had heard of Snow Patrol at that time. Um, and this was really early on. You know, I didn't deal with them when they were, they were massive. And it was just funny because if you think about it, directors in general, they, it's their essence is finding new stuff whether it's visually or audio or whatever. So they, loads of them find all these new bands or these underground bands because you like finding new talent and stuff that hasn't been done before. So it makes sense. But I just didn't know. So all of a sudden I'm just like, all right, so I'm cool then, am I? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and then you're working on a short film, but genuinely there is that crossover. There's that synergy that goes between it all. And I think what I didn't realise, because I've never really picked a career, you know, it just, I, I write music and I just happen to, do some film and do some bands and do some theatre and whatever. But the thing with that was that it, it's just art. If film music isn't a thing per se, it's, like it's music written for film or that happens to go with film. So you can do whatever the hell you like, so long as it works with it. Whereas I think, yeah, a lot of people just think, I need to practice this or practice that. It's, like, it's about emotion, isn't it? Art in general is about emotion. Totally. And I think, and whenever young composers ask me so things that, you know, might be points of advice. And I'd always say, well, be really kind of ravenous in your interest and consumption of, of the arts in the broadest sense, because you're as likely to sit down and talk to a director about a great book that you both love as you are about, you know, specifically a film or, or music. And I think that, that really shows in, you know, in your career, your ability to sort of connect with people in that way. But my inability to have time to read books, which is so awful, because a load of producers say, oh, do you, do you want to get on a book club? Or like do six or seven things. And so, and so many of my composer buddies go, well, that's a great way in, isn't it? You could meet blah, blah, blah. I've got time to read a bloody book. So I've always had to sort of say, no, no, no. But it does leave me rather lacking somewhat on the intellectual side, but I'm chatting away to them. So I'm kind of like, oh, yes, I know the book you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> And so how, how did that sort of that, that, what do you see as that your first moment of professional film composition, the moment that, you know, you... Have I reached one yet? <laughs> um, my first moment of professional, there are, I mean, there are quite a few, like, it's the, what I call the buzz moments, but I mean, you do it to get a buzz, it's the adrenaline, it's about when you're writing that, if you're talking specifically about film, then it's like those long cues where you really get that buzz, go, oh my God, get up. yes, another, I want another minute here and another two minutes, and whether it's a chase or an emotional bit or whatever, it's about that stuff that really gets you going. But I remember I did a TV series, it's one of my first ever TV things called Fallen, which was actually bizarrely enough, the thing I was nominated for a novel. Right. Uh, I'm, not, I'm honestly not just saying that. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Um, and I, I maintain that you write the best stuff when you don't know what you're doing. And it's, it's not bullshit. It's like, if you think about it, your hands have got muscle memory, right? So if you sit at the piano and start writing something, you will automatically, for me, go to E. It's the, it's the saddest key, you know, whatever. But on Fallen, I remember meeting the guys and they, want, they said they'd met five, five people, whatever, and I'd done nothing. I'd done one short film, which had got a BAFTA, a BAFTA Best Newcomer. It's called uh, Pineapple. So that got me sort of the chance to meet some people. They're going, oh, here's an interesting guy, go meet him. And yeah, and I went in and I had a chat. And they were like, well, what we really liked about your demo is it just sounded really fresh. And I suddenly realized I had a hammered dulcimer and it was there. And literally, I didn't, I couldn't 
plate flipping thing. You know, it's way too hard. You know, I've got a tuner, I don't even know how to tune it. So I ended up kind of scraping it and putting it through my Akau S3200 sampler, which at the time was the business. Um, and just doing weird and wacky things with it. Because as I say, and I, and I did manage to play some octaves and stuff, but it's when you play around with stuff, you create stuff which is completely different from what you would normally do, sitting down at the piano or sitting down the strings or on the guitar or whatever your instrument is. So I remember that and I got it and I was like, God, this is amazing, really excited. And then as I say, it was nominated for Novello and it got a BAFTA nom as well. And it was just, it was a pretty cool thing. And that got me Silent Witness, I think. And then Silent Witness got me something, I think Spooks. Oh, it finally got me Spooks, that was it, because it was directed by Mr. Spooks. God, it was a long time ago. Um, where's my hair dye? But the, but the point of it is, is when you do the most fun stuff. So when I got Limitless, um, this film that kind of went number one around the world, I remember doing a pitch for it. And I don't really pitch that much. I never really pitched for stuff before that. And it was a, my now manager in New York, and he'd said, well, look, if they're looking for someone, um, do, you, do you want to have a stab at it? So I said, God, yeah. You know. So I did it, but apparently what pitching consists of is taking scenes and doing it to picture, and here's two or three scenes. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I just kind of wrote some tracks. I said, right, here you go. Here are kind of a three three-minute tracks. And the music editor just started plopping them in the film. And they were just like, wow, this is wicked. It's got a total vibe to it. So I've gone off on one, but I think those moments when you've got Robert De Niro and Bradley Cooper looking down at the screen in Glasgow, I'm running out in the snow when my wife gets back. I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> it's like, damn it, I'm afraid our holidays the morning is just cancelled. It's <laughs> real. That's, no, that's so exciting. That's but, that, but, that, but that's my point is you do things, and this is, I'm talking about films specifically on that, but those moments, when it's just like, it's the pinch me moments, and whether it's people that you're working with, the caliber of someone you always wanted to work with, or I did a national theater thing, and I was suddenly on the, the hallowed boards of the Olivier Theater. It was my first ever time there um, on the South Bank. And all of these actors have been kind of, what do you mean it's your first time? They've spent 20, 30 years working their way up to there. It was the first ever theatre thing. I'm just like, but it's all right, isn't it? <laughs> and was that the James plays? James plays, yeah. Yeah, which I was really lucky. I got to see them. So well, um, I, that, those tickets were like gold dust. It was a very special uh, experience. But but that was your first theatre. And, and I mean, how different was that as, a, as an experience from it film? Was, it was amazing. Uh, Bizarrely enough, one of those Facebook memory things came up today. I think it was like five or six years ago, but it was the recording sessions for it. And there was a fiddle player in Scotland. And so James plays were basically, you know, it was a Scottish. Yes, a Scottish please. Yeah. So I did what James won. Boards of Canada did two, and I did two with them. And Will, is it Will Gregory from Goldsboro? Yeah. He did three. So it was pretty cool. Um, they sold out the Edinburgh Festival, and then we went down, say, to um, Olivier. And when we were down there, so I'd just flown back. I've been over here doing recording sessions for Battlefield Hardlines. We had Josh Rees, Nine Inch Nails drummer. Mm. So that was cool. And it was one of those surreal moments again, because I then flew straight back to London on the way back to Glasgow, popped off in London for a few days to go and record, because I wanted to record um, the cast doing some vocal warm-ups so that I could incorporate that in the soundtrack. Because again, you know, the theatre's a different thing. So they've probably got their normal warm-ups. They call it Pass It On, where you've got a bunch of all the actors and then they start singing ah and then the next person picks another note going ah and then someone takes that note and does another one and they're in a circle I was like, this is brilliant can i sample that why the hell would you want to sample that's like god it'll be really cool so yeah so that was literally kind of then got to living and the difference between that compared to anything else was just i think i always look for either deadlines or what do you think of this or what do you think of that whereas theater they're just so busy kind of rehearsing and hanging out and being very cool people that they go, well, have you got anything for this scene? And they fade it up and they fade it down. So it's a bit more like game music like that, in the sense that it goes from one cue to the next to the next. It doesn't have a definitive start or ending because you don't know exactly how long yeah. the scene is. So it can so feel like a, a live interaction process coming, to, you know, finding that voice and finding the, the moments that you need. Yeah, it's completely. And it's like, on stage. Well, it's like, well, how do you find those moments if you're looking at a script, particularly when the script in theatre is nothing, in modern theatre, is nothing like what it will actually be in the end. So suddenly sitting there watching these guys acting for me, and it, it was just brilliant. And I had some of them singing a song, I had to write some songs for it as well. But anyway, but the point of all that was, it was just such a buzz and that collaboration. For me, I just love collaborations with people. And I think people talk about collaborations as far as 
well, you know, here, I'll do this bit and you do this bit. I think collaborations can be anything. And it's just when people feed into, again, that art and that adrenaline, it just take, collaborations just take you in a different direction, whether it's a brilliant director suddenly making you think outside where you would normally go, or whether it's an actor taking you a certain way or whatever. It's just something that gets your brain going. Totally. You mentioned earlier that, uh, about pitches, and that, that's, again, something that I think um, I get to talk to composers about, and, and some have strong opinions either way. Personally, I felt like almost pitching has kind of come back again more, and, and you know, even really super established composers are having to pitch for, you know, for projects now. Um, where do you stand on on that and Boo. Boo. <laughs> how do you feel what, what would your advice be i mean um i remember this isn't just me harking back i was on a tour bus with craig armstrong i played a couple of tracks um we went off to the paris opera house i think and i was about i don't know mid-20s and matt dunkley was there matt's a brilliant orchestrator um and composer actually his, his mind's just fab and Matt had, I think, just been pitched for something. That was the first time I'd ever heard the phrase pitch. I was like, well, what is it? <laughs> Are you joking? And clearly, you know, he was dealing with big Hollywood people, whereas I'm just sat in my studio in Glasgow, so I don't know what the hell pitching is. So, so the man that doesn't pitch for anything, I was like, it's funny because no one's ever asked me, what is it? And I think the problem with pitching is, is twofold, because one is they will give you scenes and go, here you go, go and score that. Well, how the hell can you score an individual scene if you don't it's know? In the context of that, yeah. yeah. What's the context? What's the flow? You will always overscore pitches because you're trying to show off your chops. It's like, well, yeah, I'm a brilliant composer. I can do this. I can do that. Well, that's nice, but it's just this really simple emotional scene which probably needs two piano notes and that's it. But is that going to help you get the gig? Uh, because it doesn't really show you off. Um, so that's my main issue with it. The other issue is that you have no chats with the directors or editors or music supervisors damn you uh you know or whatever but so jenny I, my feeling is i don't like doing it i don't do it that much but if i am going to do it i will insist on speaking to the director first because if you can't speak to the director and it means that they also don't necessarily value the music because sure i totally take the point of view that we don't know what we want so we're putting it out to that so you should also make sure like, how many people are actually pitching because if it's 10 people it's a shit show you know what's the point whereas if it's kind of three it means that they're genuinely interested in you as an artist but they're just not sure and what you will tend to find is that the three are completely different vibes yeah. um you know one might be a I don't know, some rock guitarist one might be a classical person one might be something else and so I don't mind doing it then because it means, all right, they generally don't know. But again, I would want to see the script first to make sure it was something, you know, there's one thing your agent phoning up and saying, hey, I've got you this pitch. That's nice. You know, what, what is it? Um, so you've got to be into it. And then, as I say, I'll insist on having a chat with the director first because without that, I just think it means that they're not necessarily invested in it. And doing a pitch might take you a couple of hours or it might take you a week. It depends how serious you want to, it. And I know loads of people over here, they have their assistants go off and do their pictures. It's like, what the? That's not why I got into it. Um, so I don't like doing it, but if I'm going to do it, then you, you want to make sure that you're getting the best possible chance in any information. And I think I don't think that's unreasonable to ask. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and is that that because one of your latest projects you did that for and that's yeah. how it came about. And so you did have that chat with the with the director. Yeah, it was um, it's Michael Caine thing, and I, it's just a little indie film. But I loved it when they sent it. You know, I was just like, oh my god! And it, I think a lot of people just go, oh, it's got such and such in it. It's got Aubrey Plaza, or it's got Michael Caine, or it's got this, or it's got that. And it's not. I just like. I think the difference between doing your big blockbuster films, where you, it's very hard to push the boundaries to an extent because it's a business. So it's like, we just want to get, well, bums on seats, <laughs> whatever happens with that, when the theatre's reopened. But it's, we've, we've invested 100 million in the film. We want to make sure we get that 100 million back. So they're not going to go for that most avant-garde soundtrack yeah. most of the time. Whereas the indie films, you get to put some heart and soul into it. And it's lovely because that, for me, is what filmmaking is about. It's about getting the emotional stuff in rather than the drums going. <laughs> and 
and there's a there's a time and a place for that. Absolutely. But I don't want to do every single flipping soundtrack like that, you know. Totally. Um, again, you mentioned your uh, your agent. At what point did you get an agent, and do you think that was the right moment? Uh, was it the right moment? Yes, in both cases, actually. I got so I have an agent who covers me for the rest of the US and the rest of the world, and I have one in the UK. Um, but my first agent that I ever got, who got me actually the Fallen gig, um, so because I've got like that BAFTA thing for the newcomer for that short film, they was like, oh, we could do something with that. Um, so yeah, and they started, and again, there's only so much they can do. I think a lot of people go, oh, my agent didn't get me any work, or my agent didn't do this. It's totally a twofold thing. You've got to make the connections. You've got to go out and meet the people because you know, they, they all say, we need something to, what's it, a hook, I think they call it. You know, we need something to, to basically make people interested. There's like a gazillion composers out there. So that was the hook. It was like the little BAFTA thing. And then Paul and say was Linda Bello and the BAFTA thing. So that then went on to Spooks and then Spooks had a five or six series of it or whatever. But it, there's always that thing is what people can do with you. Because it is a business, you know, yeah. basically. Um, if I say, you know, again, one more time, you may kill me. Uh, but it's, it's an awful habit I've got into. But it, it is a business. So they look at it, they're taking whatever, 10%, 15%, whatever percent it is. And so for them, it's got to be worth their while to put in that investment of time. So it makes sense. It's very frustrating when you're starting out. And also, what's the point of going and signing with a huge agent when you don't have a hook? Because then you're just going to be at the bottom of a roster doing nothing, giving them a percent if you happen to get a gig off your own back. Yeah. Um, am I spouting too much? So I, mean, I think agents are very agents are very good, but my advice to everyone is always: there's no point in getting what you want them to achieve for you. There's no point in getting one just for the sake of it. So if yeah. you're suddenly the next big thing, or you've suddenly got a film that you think they could do something with, go and have a meeting. And I used to find it annoying, and now it makes sense that they're very clever because they've only got so many hours in the day. So they'll speak to you and give you the time of day. And then when you do suddenly get that film, like when I got Limitless, phone was kind of ringing off the hook, but I already had this one agent over here that I really, really liked because he was genuine. He gave me the time of day for the year, year and a half previously before Limitless. And I met him and I really liked him. And more importantly, all the music supervisors and the heads of music over here in LA that I spoke to said that there's one person specifically that we would take a reel from we would trust his judgment because he's got great taste, he's passionate about music, and he's not a dick. So it's like, it, we, we really, really like him. And that was, God, what, 10 years ago or whatever. It, just because he sees it long term, it's not just yeah. a big opposition. He sees you, he sees me for what it is. So, yeah. But yeah. ask me in six months, I'll be going, dick. <laughs> 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 so let's come round to Tales from the Loop um, because I think there's quite a lot to discuss on this one. And again, I'd love to know, I guess, how it came about, because um, not only is it great that you got the, the gig, but you got it to write it together with Philip Glass, which is, you know, and still that, that thing is, it is quite unusual to have two composers um, working together. Obviously, you know, there, there are great examples of it working really well, like Dustin O'Halloran and Volker Bertelman, and, um, but, but it's still more unusual and um and yeah and it's philip glass so yeah tell us everything how did it how did it happen it's everything um is it always sounds very self-deprecating when you go philip glass we're not worthy i had that feeling to begin with i don't get starstruck i work with a lot of people and i work with a lot of bands and you know, and then meet a lot of people and to me people are just people you know they happen to be very good at their jobs but in the end, they're just another person. Um, Philip is genuinely, this will sound so sycophantic, he's an artist that I admire so much and always have. Um, and to go over and meet him was almost one of those surreal moments. Not starstruck, but kind of sitting there, kind of, I'm in a kitchen with Philip Gloss having a cup of tea discussing the quality of American tea. You know, it's like, <laughs> should we talk about the music at some stage? Um, but how it came about, I think, so I work with a director called Errol Morris a lot. Um, Philip had worked 
with Errol, I think for the first, I, I, again, I'm awful with numbers, maybe sort of four or five films. Philip was Errol's sound, his music pounded for it. Errol won um, Oscar for the Fog of War, I think it was. Um, yeah. I've, again, it, it, and maybe Thin Blue Line as well. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, he's just he, he is Errol's another one. Yeah, he's just he's phenomenal. He's the greatest living documentary maker. So Philip was very much his sound, and then this this is going to be a very long story to show you how it comes about. But for if you're there and if there's anybody there and you're starting to do film composing, then this will teach you how to get into it. Um, I had done a pitch for an Errol film years ago called The Known Unknown or The Unknown Known. Again early, get my head around, whichever one it was. Philip couldn't do it. He was busy. Um, and so I'd been asked to pitch for it. Uh, but it wasn't a pitch against other people. It was just a case of, here, can you go and do a couple of tracks? Errol's only ever used Philip before. So I did a couple of tracks and Danny Elfman got the gig. <laughs> so <it's laughs> like, Right, I, I presume he didn't pitch. <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, all learning curve. This was years ago, whatever. You know, I really enjoyed the process. His editor, Stephen Hathaway, I loved the pieces, got on so well. Anyway, I had a really in-depth conversation with him, you know, while I was doing the pitch and so on. And it was just a couple of tracks, it didn't take that long. Um, and then I got a call from a guy in New York, Jim Keller, who's say, now my manager. And he, it, was, it was his office and saying, is this track yours? And they played it to me. I was like, I really recognise it. What is that? And you, you write so much music. It's like, I think that's mine, but you know, well, I sound like everybody else, so it must it's probably them, you know, whatever. And then I was like, oh yeah, that was the track I did for Errol's pitch. And they said, right, we just had a call saying, can we license it for a film? And they thought it was Philip. <laughs> I swear I didn't plagiarise him. So I said, of course they can license it, they can have it, you know, it's fine. And as we, was, we were saying earlier on, you know, I, <laughs> there's never a right or a wrong decision. You, you make decisions with the best knowledge that you have. But yeah. for me, it was like a case of, look, it was a pitch. It wasn't even properly produced up. You just take it, it's fine. It was for, it was for I think it was for a bunch of short films that, so it, it was either the New York Times, the, I think it was the Washington Post were doing on Nobel Prize winners. And so anyway, so, so they used it, long story, long story short, they used the track. And I got on really well with Stephen, and then he got in touch about four Who months. Who was the ago. editor? Who was the editor? Right. Editors, very important people. Yeah. Um, every one of those poor people never get out of their <laughs> room. It's kind of like composers, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, he's the editor, and he said, "Look, Errol's doing a bunch of five short films on mascots, very bizarre films on kind of sports mascots and stuff like that." And it was, it was called "The Crazy World of Sports" for ESPN. It was a total blast. And again, I wrote a bit of music for it, licensed some tracks to it. But oh, it was fun. I, it was, I mean, anything with Errol is fun, but anything with Stephen is also fun. So it was just like, it was such a ride. So that was really cool. And then about a year later, one of his producers phoned up and said, hey, we're doing this thing. Do you want to have a chat about it? And it was a thing called Wormwood, which was a series for Netflix. But at that time, it wasn't going to be a series. It was going to be a film. So it started chatting away about that. But then that got put on hold because they were trying to get some more funding. And he said, I'm doing this, Errol's doing this little film on um, his mate, Elsa Dorfman, who's this photographer. It's called The B-Side. Would you like to try working with Errol? <laughs> Would I like to try working with Errol? <laughs> and bizarrely enough, I'd just been finishing the National Theatre stuff, the James plays. Stephen had heard the James plays and he was like, really love this. This is beautiful. You know, I'm going to try temping it up with your music. Oh, it's just, it's gorgeous. I was like, well, thank you very much, you know, and that was just like a little string quartet kind of thing. Um, so anyway, but long boring story, but basically, so I did the B-side and he said, well, how's this going to work? Errol's never really worked with another composer before, so why don't we try doing maybe like three or four tracks and just see, you know? So I had a long chat with Errol, getting to know you, uh, and then he talks more than me, which is hard to believe. He's just a funny, funny guy. So yeah, so I did, did three or four tracks and then did some more. And that film is just beautiful, A, because of the subject matter. It's one of his best friends. She, she died at the start of this year. But she's a brilliant photographer. It was a really cool soundtrack. It was about where digital meets analog. As far as photography, she does like huge photos, maybe six foot high on an old Polaroid camera. Um, it's one of only like five or six in the world. So the whole soundtrack basis was, I'm going to do everything in one take. Instead of doing everything on Pro Tools and beautifully done and chop it all up, 
I want to hear the imperfections like she would get with the Polaroid. So there was a kind of thought process behind it. And I was like, I mean, yeah. this is really cool. The quartet were going, okay, we'll do another take. No, you won't. That's it. <laughs> have Miley Cyrus as double bass player. It was just, it was a really fun thing. It had me on guitar and I don't play guitar at all. It was awful. Uh, but again, it was, it creates a vibe. Um, so it, it, was, it was just really fun. And my mate Ross, he did some proper guitar on it as well. And I don't know, just, it, I don't think Aaron did some, it, it was cool. But the point is, it went so well. I then got to do Wormwood with Errol, which was just, again, I, I know I keep saying this, but we, we hired our Captain Studios for three days, had a quartet in there, just played away. It was fun, it was experimenting. And I remember I went and played piano when I was in Capital. I think it's like the Nat King Cole piano. And Stephen was there and I just did about six hours recording the piano. And he thought we were ready to go after, you know, after the quartet. I said, no, 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 just switch the lights off and just relax. I'm gonna sit here and you know, record all the piano stuff instead of the MIDI. And now I've got my grand through in the live room. But then Stephen was like, you're such a composer. He said, that with everybody else, they'd just be the hell out of here. It's like, right, time's up, that's the quartet done, time for the pub. Um, and so Wormwood went really well, and it was just really, really fun. And I got to, you know, there's a very sh small team that they have. This is Errol specifically. But then I did American Dharma, which was a film that I did with Errol last year on Steve Bannon. And I started a new film with Errol yesterday. So the point of all of this is, it all basically stemmed from doing a pitch, I guess, but it wasn't a pitch against other people, it was against myself, and I still didn't get it. Work that one out. <laughs> but, and then licensing that track for basically nothing, not because it was a business decision, but it's like, God's yeah, sake, it's, it's, right. it's an Oscar winner. You can take one of my pieces, it's fine, you know? It yeah. doesn't cost me anything, and it was just a little demo that I had going around, so, yeah. Wow, so that got- I'm more senseless, Lucy. Lucy's like, oh my God. I know, I'm just like- so much. <laughs> I'm trying to steer it back round to to the tales from the loop. Oh <laughs> my god! I knew there was a point to this very boring story. I bought myself. No, not at all. It's this really great. But, so yeah, so that was the Errol relationships. stuff. Relationships. So, yeah, relationships. So that was the Errol stuff. But it is connected because then you got Philip. So Philip's done all of Errol stuff. You got uh, Mark there, Romanet, who is who did directed one hour photo, and more importantly, never let me go, which I adored as a film. Beautiful film, yeah. But Mark had always wanted to use Philip, never got it quite together. You know, I think a few things just didn't quite happen. And so he was like, right, I want to do this. Philip's never done a TV series before. Philip's also the busiest guy in the world. It's like four operas at a time. You know, he's, he's a creator, whatever he is, A384. He's just this brilliant, brilliant mind. So I think someone, I think someone at Disney and Fox had said, well, there's Paul. Paul did Wormwood. Mark was like, I adore Wormwood. And Nathaniel, brilliant showrunner, said, oh, I love Wormwood. You? And Mark was like, that was Paul, was it? Like, yeah, love that. Well, look, they both work with Errol. There's obviously got to be something there that's a similarity in the style, but not the same. Um, I can't believe I'm comparing myself to Philip like that and not comparing myself like that, but I just mean as far as, you know, there are Absolutely, some... Yeah, some and, and Errol said that as well. He said, you know, you're, you're kind of like, you've got some of Philip's sensibilities, but you've also got a weirdness about you, not about, but about the music. Um, so anyway, so I think that's how it came about. They just like, so they flew me over. I had a chat with Philip. We had a look at some of the visuals. Nothing was created uh, at that stage. Nothing was shot. We were looking at the book, which is visuals of Simon Stalinhag. So freaking cool. And yeah, and we just got writing and I didn't know how it was going to work. Again, going back to that collaboration. So I was like, well, what do, what do we doing you know are you doing stuff and I'm doing stuff or are you sending stuff over or how's how's this going to work there are eight episodes and we just didn't know so Philip started writing some stuff he would um, pdf me over some of his manuscript paper um, and I'd be looking at that going okay that's fine here's a theme let's try the theme here okay well actually I've just written something what do you think of this and then he would listen to the stuff that I've written and go oh I like that what if we did this with it and so on and it was just, I use this phrase, but organic process, just because I think it's the best, best description. Yeah. You, know, you don't plan things out, it just happens. So the only steer we really had from Mark and Nathaniel was that they wanted it to be an analog soundtrack. And I was, I was saying to some the other day, American sensibilities and descriptions, very important, are different from UK. So when he said analog, I thought he meant, I don't know if you can see, but like these bad boys here and all my synths. Right, right. This one over here. So I, so I was going, well, this is interesting. I guess I'll be doing the synths and Philip will be doing the piano then. You know, so I was like, right, here you go. I was like, what the hell's that? I was like, well, it's the weirdness. He said, no, no, oh, no, I mean, analog as in 
nothing digital. I just nothing want digital. All I just want normal players, real players. Instruments. I'm like you could have said that. Sorry, you know, like Google Translate was off between American and UK. So yeah, and so after that, that was really the only steer. So Philip and I just started bouncing ideas off each other. You know, him in New York, me in LA, and it really did just grow like that. Both of us would send tunes to each other. Both of us would send calls to each other, and it just happened. Amazing. And another unusual, I still think, um, aspect of it is, is that you were writing from script stage, basically. I mean, you were on bef way before it even started filming. And, yeah. and I know, I mean, I think every director is different and every uh, composer is different. And I, I've had these conversations with Gabriel Yared, for example, who loves... Oh, well, thank you for giving me your time this morning. You know, when you deal with a proper composer. <laughs> And putting you in the same group. Um, and Gabrielle, you know, famously, he, he loves working from script. He, he wants to write themes that are about stories and feelings. Honestly. And absolutely, at all of the Anthony Minghella films, he, he wrote most of it from script stage. Anthony loved that too. And a lot of those themes stayed the same right, you know, right to the end. And that, you know, they're in. But could he films. envisage it when he's it, reading that script? He's, he says it's all for him that it's all about the kind of the emotions and the stories and that actually he's not visual at all. Of course, there comes a point where you're going to have to, you know, work to certain time scale, time references and yeah. on whatever. But, but yeah, he's, he feels very much that, you know, he's, he's writing music about these, these themes. So, so you and, and, but not everyone works that way. Yeah, I'm shit at it like that. And honestly, like I read a script. Did they send you scripts and say, hey, do you want to do this? Or do you want to do this? Do you have a look at it? <laughs> she comes in wearing a blue coat. Right, I'm shutting my eyes going, okay, blue. Well, it could be light blue, dark blue. And my wife, who's a graphic designer, she, she's just like, that's not even blue, Paul, that's green. <laughs> oh, right, okay, no, I just, I can't envisage, I mean, obviously I can read a story, right? Yes, I can envisage that. But I can't see the emotional depth behind the story really, or particularly from a script rather than a book. Um, so for me, it's much more about seeing, and it doesn't matter how rough the rough cut is, but suddenly seeing, like Mark was sending me pictures from when they they're in Canada shooting, and he was sending me it as the set was being built. And here's my, this is the director, Mark, uh, and his wife's just amazing. And giving an example, Simon's book, uh, Tales of the Loop, because perhaps you probably haven't seen it, but it's about kind of, it's sci-fi, but it's not sci-fi, about weird things that happen in a town because of this thing, the, the eclipse underneath the town. And there are robots there. And so obviously coming from dread world, it's like, oh my God, there are robots, they're gonna take over the world. Uh, so Philip and I wrote quite a dark theme. And Mark's like, I mean, this is beautiful, but why is it so scary? Well, like, well because here's the robot. I don't have the book with me, it's I think through in the other studio, but like, because there's a robot there. And I guess, that you could make it a dark story, but it's like, yeah, but the robots just are. They're not hurting anybody. They just coexist with people. That's just weird things that happen. So if you don't understand the basics of the script or what's going on, don't be embarrassed to ask because it's bloody fundamental. You'll feel like more of a dick in a month's time when you've written a completely wrong score as opposed to, no, but genuinely, like, as yeah, opposed absolutely. to just turning up and saying, look, I know I'm thick, but I'm a bloody good composer. I don't quite get this bit. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But what there is something wrong with is pretending that you know it all. Because then you're going to get found out so quickly. The whole point of a collaboration is like, I don't quite understand what you were trying to do there. Would you mind just fitting me in? I love this bit and this bit. So yeah, so that, that's a prime example because then the robot thing, if I was reading a script, how the hell do you know that the robot's not bad? If you're looking at the book, you don't know that the robot's not bad. And it's only when you speak to the director because there's so many of the effects still to go on and there's so many other things to go on. It's only then by having that chat that you realise it's like, okay, so the start of any project, have a chat with the director yeah. and, just, and shut the hell up, even for someone like me, and just let them speak and say, tell me about it. It seems like Mark and Nathaniel were particularly open like that, that it was a very healthy uh, um, yeah. conversation and, through the whole process. And period. again, you know, normally with pilots people are so busy and it's just carnage you, you you struggle to get half an hour chatting with the director it's like look i'll come i'll drive to you wherever you are i'll fly to you just give me half an hour um but those two because they hadn't shot anything it was like this really again this really close family 
we had Nathaniel, the showrunner, that had written every single script that was on the set for every six months, which again doesn't happen. He was overseeing the whole thing. You've got Mark. Mark's created this wonderful visual style. Philip and me, Arnie, the post producer, um, and George, the music super. And, and really, it, it, that was it, along with the editors and stuff. It was this really close shift. Yeah. And because of that, it makes it a lot easier to have that kind of collaboration because you're not waiting 10 days for a load of other opinions to come back you're just you know, it's you guys making those decisions you mentioned george there it's interesting because I, I i watched a um a conversation that was organized by the guild of music supervisors in the u.s a couple of weeks ago well, george is the music supervisor and, yes anybody. sorry george draculius um who is a, a legend in his his own name and he um, makes amazing bread like the, the <laughs> bread that he makes is unbelievable. He comes in the first half an hour of any conversations about what sandwich he's had that day. <laughs> <laughs> he was interesting because because he was on this conversation and and he um, it, and he it was it was a group of, of different music supervisors who'd all all worked on Amazon projects of different sorts. He was obviously there for Tales from the Loop. And somebody asked, oh, um, you know, what was it like working with the composers? And when enough, he, he said, well, Paul and Morgan. No, he said, Paul and Morgan's amazing. In fact, you should all hire him for all of your really? projects. Yeah. Right, where's my wallet? Hang on, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's sweet. <laughs> but he was saying how he didn't really speak to, to Philip. He was really de dealing with you. And, and I wondered whether, because, you know, from my point of view as a music supervisor, I've worked on projects where I've been really hands-on with the composer, everything from helping choose the composer. Oh, you're one of those, are you? Peter. <laughs> to, where I, to where I actually put my finger on the button. <laughs> <laughs> to helping with recording, all of that. To, and, and a lot of it in that sort of um, uh, translation part in the middle of uh, maybe between a director and a composer, you know, helping that be a, a sort of seamless relationship. But then I've worked on other projects where I've had absolutely nothing to do with the composer, maybe because they, they've already worked with the director, they've just got a direct relationship and... Um, well, so, and so is, that, is that because of a specific project? It's because they've already got a relationship formed, so it's almost like well, there's nothing for me to do to... Often it exactly that. is, and so really then I'm looking after the commercial songs and, and, and that's that. But, but I kind of wonder from your point of view, how you feel about that. Do you, you, know, do you like a music supervisor being on board? Do you like that? Being part I of like, life. do you know what, the, the best feeling about, and I know we're talking specifically here about film music and TV music to an extent, the best feeling about doing it as a job is, composing is a quite a lonely job, intentionally, as much as anything else. You know, you, some people like doing it with other people, I like just shutting myself away, I've got lots of daylight here, so it's, it's all nice. Um, but you know, I like throwing myself into it. If I get a first pass of something, I just stay up for three nights on end and literally just blitz a first pass. Half of it's probably shit, but I like getting into that vibe. And then afterwards, I'll then yeah, never ever play a first pass to anybody. <laughs> I've got this great idea and I'm playing it really loud. It must be great. <laughs> um, but, so it is inherently lonely. And then when you get a musician or you go to a studio, you have a big orchestra or whatever, those are the moments that make it fantastic because you're then working with other people that are bringing something to it and also because you've then got that human connection with someone. And what I like about film music and TV music specifically is that sense of camaraderie. And as I keep saying about um, Errol's lot and I keep saying about Tales from the Loop, when you have a small group of people that you can work with, it's like a little family. And it's a really weird feeling when the series is finished or the film's finished because suddenly it's... I've just been speaking to you every single day, not for moral support, but because it really feels like, I think Anton um, is a music supervisor and he described it the best as he said, yeah, I want to feel like I've been in the trenches with you, which by the end of it, without, and it, it sounds stupid, but you want to feel like you achieved something together. So as far as music supervisors, what I love about dealing with them is you're kind of also discussing source songs. It's not like I'm suggesting to you because my you know, my musical taste is probably awful compared to yours, but it's not like I'm suggesting things, although there's a film one at the moment where we're, we're talking about stuff. But it's more just the fact that you're all passionate about music. You're all passionate about the project that you're doing. Otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Or if you are, you're doing the wrong thing. But it's like, so you're chatting away about it. 
And then, I don't know, there's just this lovely camaraderie. And so the, that music supervisor for me is an integral part of it because he or she are the ones also that have normally had some role in bringing you on board. Like Limitless, first thing I ever did, um, first thing I ever did, my first big film over here, Season Kent. I don't know if you know Season, but she's Brilliant. a great, yeah. sweet, wonderful human being. Again, you'll see me say this about people and it's not bullshit. It's because a lot of people that are in this industry because it's music, you know, it's, it's your passion. It's got to be your passion, otherwise you're not going to do it. So the season, she got me and she, she phoned up and going, going back to 10 hours ago, whatever it was that I said, you know, it's like, oh, I rushed out and I'm like, yeah, I got the gig. I remember her phoning up and I was like, oh, hey, season. And obviously she was phoning from LA, LA and I was in Glasgow. I was like, hey, so, so I'm phoning about Limitless. I was like, yeah, and I, I think I did my terribly British deprecating thing. Oh yeah, don't worry, you don't have to phone me up to tell me that I haven't got it. So, oh, well, Actually, no, you have got, but, but almost it's like from that moment, and I, again, I've told this story before, but the way that I actually got Limitless, or got Limitless, yes, it was the pitch and they all loved it, but I wasn't going to get it because they didn't know who the hell I was. They were like, well, you might have BAFTAs and you might have that, but no one in America really knows who the heck he is. And I watched a, a soccer game, I watched a football game this season, um, my friend, music supervisor Natalie Bartz over here who's now works at BMI this is all my long this is again I guess this is a, how do you get into it Bartzy had phoned me up before I came over here um, and said oh just phone me say hi I've heard your album Film Tales love it would you mind if I license some stuff for a trailer or something and Natalie's one of the most knowledgeable people about the, just film score in general again she just loves doing it so I kind of met her for a coffee when I was over here and she's oh you should come and meet some people and I think I was doing Spooks and I was producing this band over here, which is why I was over here. Um, so yeah, and so anyway, long boring story, but basically that's what happens when you get me at this time of morning. It's like, oh my God, he's had a coffee. Um, so Natalie phoned up and it was about six o'clock on a Saturday morning. She's the only person I know that would phone you up at that time. And I was here by myself, my wife's back in the UK and she says, oh, you can come and watch, come and watch Chelsea play. I was like, really? And she's, she's kind of, <laughs> really it's six o'clock in the morning. In actual fact, I am up because I've just been finishing off an episode of Spooks, but I'm now going to bed. She said, oh, come on, come on. I was like, okay, she said, you can sleep later. So, and it was at Season's house. But see, it was Season's a West Ham supporter. Don't ask me why, you know, uh, not just because it's West Ham, but because she's you know, from over here. Yeah. And I remember virtually nothing of that morning because I was so flipping tired. Apparently Chelsea won because I asked her later. But that was the only time I've met Season. And Season happened to be Music Suit on Limitless. So when it then came to, they were discussing you know, the pictures. And they said, look, we love this guy, Paul's pitch, but we just don't know who he is. We need a safe pair of hands because we've only got you know, three weeks to get it done or whatever. And Season, oh, hang on, Paul Anna Morgan, I think. And I could be elaborating the story, but either way, it's good. She then phones up Natalie and says, Nat, was that guy Paul Anna Morgan, the one that came to watch? <laughs> She's like, yeah, yeah, that's what's the right phone. Yeah, he exists. I watched the trailer. Yeah, so, so good example, we say, yeah. But again, you've just got to go out and do as many things as you can, but I'm combining a billion stories together. Go out and do as many things as you can. But the point of that is music supervisors, if they've got your back, it feels great because music is one of the last things to happen to a film. And if people aren't sure about a film, and they've said they've invested however many millions in it, all they want is it to be all right, just not to just don't cock it up, this is the last thing, or the film might need saving. Or if you're very lucky, it's a brilliant film and you get to have a blast on it. But either way, music, you know, it's been shot, it's been edited, mostly, there's still the effects to go on. And if, you know, a lot of people have invested a lot of money in it. They're all nervous, they've all got their own opinions. And your role as a composer is to go, guys, don't panic, it's gonna be fine, trust me. And not in a patronizing way, but in a way of- You instill oh, confidence, yeah. Yeah, I can totally see where this film is going. And if you don't like it, that's also fine. And then we can have another chat. But let me do my thing first without meddling. And yeah. a good music supervisor will have your back and just hold them off and, and filter the notes. Yeah. Um, you know, that comes through. And the same with the music editor as well. Um, you know, they will filter those notes so that you don't quite get the brutal, this is shit. <laughs> but you get the kind of like, this, you know, this isn't what we're after. Try working it this way, working it that way. Because it's all about confidence as a composer. Well, for me anyway, I'm sure different people will say different oh, things, but so you're scared shitless. When you have a look at, <laughs> if anyone is listening, that's ironic. <laughs> uh, but if you have a look at a picture to begin with, it can go any way you want. And that's the joy of it and the buzz and the nervousness of it. But similarly, 
don't try and second guess what they want. Just do your thing. And you can have a conversation afterwards if it's not right, but there's got to be a reason for you taking on that project to begin with. There's got to be something which is going, I can bring something to that. I know what I would do, or I think I would know. And let's say like this, this film here, is it plugged down, isn't it? It's on, it's on science. So I was mucking around the other day. Is it on? No, it's probably not on. Uh, but I was, I was mucking around with these samples the other day. And I have no idea what I'm doing. Is this on? Come on, you can do it. No, it's rubbish. Well, there you go. That's why you don't play stuff in live. <coughs> and it's like a spaceship. You can't really hear it. Definitely tuning. That was probably the worst demo ever. But the point <laughs> is, I literally phoned up the director and did that. And I was like, just, just listen to this. Do <laughs> play a few things. And it was on space. And I was suddenly coming up, I said, you know what? I'm going to go and get these NASA sounds. I think I told you about this. NASA's got a website where you can download a lo load of sounds from stars and other places and stuff like that. And I started sampling them and started detuning them. And again, some of it sounds bloody awful. It was like, what the hell? But when you get those moments to start doing it, and I sent it, and I'd already done a first pass up to about 30 minutes, and I said, oh my God, I've just got this, I've actually detuned a star, I've made this rhythm out of it, and I put a wavelength over that, fed it through a load of weird stuff, and that had a cool kind of radio effect on it, which you can't hear. Uh, great job, Paul. And he was suddenly really into it, not because of, it's very easy to come up with a bullshit story, like, oh yes, I sampled there, I sampled that. It might have been bloody awful, but you've got to try out and experiment things. And if you told that story to someone at the start of the soundtrack, they go, well, I'm going to go and sample a star. So, okay, we'll go and get the next person now, because he's clearly you know, had a little bit too much coffee. But when you do it, you've got to try those things out, because that's what's calling you to begin with. And if it doesn't work, then fine, go and do something else. But it's having that confidence to do something. So a good director, a good music supervisor, a good music editor, a good team will give you that confidence to let you do your thing to begin with, and will then rein you back in. Okay, so we've only got about five minutes left, and there are a couple of questions. Um, so this is from How Dred doesn't he shut up? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> number one. Um, Dread guitar owner here. Hope you're enjoying the custom guitar picks I gave you. Any news oh, about? Oh, they're fantastic. They're, they're in my drawer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, any news about Dread Two or Mega City One? What's your mindset when composing the music for it? Is it's very synth and industrial heavy? Did 80s mov movies like Robocop, Terminator, Blade Runner influence you when composing said movie? Uh, I know nothing about, I'm just a lowly composer and I wish I had more information when people always phone up. I, there will clearly never be a dread to, I do think as far as a film, but there's you know, the TV series and so on. I would adore it if it happened, whether I was involved or not, because as far as comics go, I mean, it's a natural thing for Netflix to do, like standalone things, like going along and so on. Um, as far as musical inspiration, um, Blade Runner to a degree, Blade Runner always, but not for a specific project. I just freaking love the original kind of soundtrack. It's just so good. It's the sounds of it and so on. Um, yes, very synth heavy, but in actual fact, there was a lot of guitar in it. It was just a lot of really weird guitar that you don't even know that it's guitar. So yes, there are a lot of synths, and it was before I actually had a ton of analog gear, um, but there are quite a lot of analog synths in there. Um, but as far as the process goes, which is a longer process than you've got time for, uh, it didn't start off as a synth heavy soundtrack and it basically evolved as we went along until finally finding that moment. And again, prime example of great collaborator, Alex Garland. Um, you know, it's, he picks individual notes. That's a note too much. That's a note too much. He hears every single sound in his head. So that by the time you're finished, he's like, well, the hi-hat in bar 17, we don't need that because it's interfering with Anderson's speech or whatever. All those things, it's his head sort of imagining where it goes. But as far as the sound for it, by the time you finish with pool stretch, by the time you finished with your analog synths and so on, I'd done, I think I was on the end of pass two when I suddenly found that sound. I was like, just let me do my thing. It was a prime example. It was a bit rockier than the sound we've actually got. It was a Marmar track, which I think I shoved on the album, which wasn't used in the film, but is a guitar-based version, which I did to begin with, and it had some real balls. And then I took the drums for that, stripped everything else out, and put on a load of analog synths, and that became the rise of Marmar, and that was basically the evolution of them. I went back and did another pass. I said, look, just give me a couple of days. I know where I am with the sound now. Went off and did the thing, and that's how it happened. Thank you so much for the picks. I love them. Um, and this is from an anonymous attendee. 
one of the things I struggle with as a solo creative is structure and being organized and it's affected my mental health. Are there any tips that you can share about organizing composition workflow or even organizing your day stroke week, e.g. setting aside a day for business development, making sure, um, uh, making sure you regularly label and save musical ideas, um, also following your comment. Would love to know if you've got any lessons on guitar in your, if, if you've got, had any lessons on guitar in your career, as I'm feeling guilty about trying to compose above my grade on things. No, 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 no. I, I'm going to take that in reverse. Okay. Because that is fundamentally, I thought it was bit, he, she was being sarcastic, saying, have you had any lessons on guitar? I was like, shut up. <laughs> um, I used to have exactly that, right, which is that I'm a really good pianist. Well, I get by. But, so piano, piano, I'm fine with. Strings, I used to play them all, so that was how I know how strings work. So it's not, can I just repeat to everybody, never, never, never just go like that on your samples. I detest ostinatos. It's like, that is not how you play a violin or a cello. Um, damn you sample libraries. But anyway, so I used to have exactly that. I was very nervous. I was very, God, you know, I'm not a proper, I think it's not just imposter syndrome, but it's like, I should leave that to the professionals because that was kind of how I developed. We would have professional musicians come up into the studio and play a violin or a drum or whatever. And then it was Errol's B side to say it was the first thing I'd ever just done. I was like, look, for God's sake. And normally I would just give it to, say, Ross or Aaron to my guitarist to go and play on. And that, because it was so organic, this whole thing, how I said it was all just one take. I mean, there's a lot of fifths on it. Gotta be honest, it's like ding, 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 ding. But I was putting it through effects and so on. And by the end of it, it was beautiful. Not in a guitar way, but in an effect way. So what I said earlier on about my Hammond Dulcimer, take any instrument, muck around with it. Never, ever, ever feel that you shouldn't touch it until I wish I could. Okay, I'm gonna do this. So this is my this is my wall of tricks. All right. So you got various things which I can't play for the love of it. But the whole point is, and this is just like my writing room, but the whole point is that you should be mucking around with anything you can to try it. Because otherwise, you, know, you could say this happy drum that's here, I still love this. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You know, stick it there. But I, and I ended up using it as a soundtrack and it was bloody great. And it suddenly became like the main theme. So you can take as many takes as you want. It's the wonderful thing. But the point is, you don't have to be professional. As far as mental health, um, Shut up, have young for ages. As far as mental health, I totally get that. Uh, as far as structure goes, you know, it's it's weird, and particularly during lockdown, man. It's yeah, you know, I've I've got two great kids and a great wife, and I'm bloody fortunate like that. And it's still I'm here in my studio, and it's very easy to let it all get on top of you uh, without getting into politics and whatever else. Can be. It just makes you feel, oh my god, I've got no one to, to talk to, and even if you do talk to someone over the phone, you're still by yourself then you've got to try and concentrate on composing, which you've got, you know, composing on this and you've got to be in the mood for it and you've got to get in the mood. And for me, my way of composing is I just come in every single day and you just get on with it. It's really busy at the moment. So you just need to get on with it. But if you're doing business development, I don't know if that, that person's just starting out or whatever. So if you're trying to sort of meet people or get in touch with people, for me, I can't do both. Uh, I'm awful at the business side anyway, but I can't be, thinking, right, I'm going to compose between nine and 12. Then I'll go and do an hour's worth of emails to someone. Then I'll go and have some lunch. Then I'll come back and do that. I need to throw myself into my composing. So if it was me, and everyone's got to find their own way anyway, but I would do, do your composing on the Monday or the Monday and Tuesday, if you're on a project or whatever, or if you're, you're coming up with sounds or whatever it is that you're doing, do that the Monday and Tuesday. And Wednesday, don't punish yourself. Just go, right, sod it. You know, Wednesday, I'm going to do my business side I'm going to email people or I'm going to call them or I'm going to focus on that side of it but for me I don't have the brain space to do both you know I'm working on sort of like four or five soundtracks at the moment and my head is exploding and so you've got to kind of compartmentalize for me it used to be the kind of right okay well so I'm, I'm finishing a couple up but it used to be a case of right Monday I'll work on that one Tuesday I'll work on Limitless the TV series Wednesday I'll work on Dawn of War the game Thursday I'll do that because I can't flip between the morning and the afternoon and the evening. My brain just can't do it. And it's, it, I don't know, it's not very conducive to the creative process. So I think my limited advice, and don't quote me on it, but I would definitely put aside your days rather than your hours. I think it's better for the brain if you go, right, Monday I'll compose and go off for a walk. 
You know, it's good just to go off for, even if it's a 15 minute walk, just clear your head a bit. The difference it makes, I got into running when I came over here and I was just going out for runs at half past five in the morning because instead of being on a plane the entire time, I had a bit of time. And that half hour in the morning for me was just brilliant because it would clear my head. I would listen to podcasts, I would do whatever. And suddenly the world wasn't a shit place. Yeah, it was like, it was a good place. It was a good way to start the day because you're collecting your thoughts and just don't watch too much news because it's a 24 hour cycle. That's a great note to end on. The world according to Paul. <laughs> Thank you so much for, especially in your super busy moment of juggling all those projects. Thank you so much for taking the time. You are more than welcome, but honestly, like it, it's the best job. <laughs> it really is. I mean, and so many people always kind of think like, oh, well, how do I get into it? Or how do I do this? Or how do I do that? It's like, however you get into it, whether it's through luck, through fooling people, however you do it, just enjoy it. And the, the thing that I always say to everybody is don't try it and sound like other people. Don't try and imitate people. You've got to have the chops and you've got to be able to do good drum programming, do all your big drums and do your string off donatos. But don't make that you because why would people come to you I as opposed to 10,000 other people? And it's very easy to sit here and say that. I get it if you're just starting out, it's like, oh, what do I do, you know? But you've got to create your own style and you need to have the ability to adapt so that it might be more in the style of blah for a film or more in the style of blah. But you've got to bring yourself into that project because yeah, that's the thing that people are going to react to. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. And Miss you. Thank you to all the people out there who we can't see um, <laughs> for spending the afternoon with us. Morning. That's like stalkerish. Thank you, I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> I will see you when this is all over and I'm back in London. Brilliant. I look forward to it. Right. See you, Lucy.